Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Kiev. Welcome everybody at the opening of the fifth Ukrainian investment forum, Evolution After Revolution, hosted by the CFA Society Ukraine. This year was probably one of the most challenging in the history of Ukraine, and thank you very much for being with us and for coming today. My name is Ross, I am the board member at the CFA Society Ukraine, and will serve today as the master of ceremony. The purpose of our conference is to create a non-biased, high-profile, professional discussion on the new place of Ukraine on the world map, the integration into EU, reforms, economy, debt and equity markets. And now I have the honor to invite two charter holders for the official welcoming speech. Just in a few minutes, you will see the president of the CFA Society Ukraine, Yevhen Grebenyuk. And right now, please welcome an uh, experienced investment banker, a big friend of Ukraine, and the board member of the CFA Institute, Attila Koksal, who came from Turkey to give the welcoming speech. Ladies and gentlemen, dear members of the Ukrainian financial community, welcome to the fifth uh, Ukrainian Investment Forum. I would like to thank the Ukrainian CFA Society for organizing this great event. Actually, the Ukrainian Society is one of the most active societies uh, in the EMEA region of CFA Institute, so I'd like to congratulate all volunteer members and leaders of the society. And also I'd like to thank to all these sponsors that made this event possible. So this is the fourth time I am attending this event and I've been given uh, this honor for the third time to speak, to make the opening speech on behalf of CFA Institute. So it's a great honor and privilege for me. This year I had a difficult time preparing my speech. Unfortunately, the current investment environment and both the economic and political outlooks are quite different than the past. In 2012-2013, it was much easier for me. Ladies and gentlemen, I am an investment banker from Turkey and I spent most of my career in an emerging market in Turkey, which is at times quite similar to Ukraine. Especially the first 20 years of my career looked like a, a roller coaster ride. In Turkey, we had to deal with political uncertainties, coalition governments, high inflation, high real interest rates. Uh, I'm sure some of you know that between 1980 and 2000, uh, even 2005, for 20 to 25 years, our inflation averaged more than 50 percent. That's the average inflation rate. No other country had such an experience. And also we had big current account deficit, we still have one, and uh, major problems in the economy. And on top of that, we also faced all the surrounding country or regional crises, like the Asian crisis, the Gulf crisis, and of course the Russian crisis. They all made a big impact on Turkey, which was a high beta emerging market. So we were always in a crisis mode. And then came 2001, the Turkish crisis. And that crisis wiped out more than one third of the Turkish banking sector, bankrupted many companies and individuals. Our currency was devalued by more than 50%. Our stock market crashed. Overnight interest rates went as high as 7,000%. And many people lost their jobs. And at the time, I was the CEO of an investment house in Turkey. So we were the most profitable investment house, and we were the like, second largest in asset management and second largest in uh, brokerage. But unfortunately, we were a subsidiary of a commercial bank. And that commercial bank happened to fail in the crisis. 
So along with all the other subsidiaries of the bank, we were turned over to the Savings Deposit Insurance Fund. And within weeks, I lost all my team, because the salaries were too high, so they were laid off, and I had to go too. So I also lost my job. So in 2001, we thought it was all over for Turkey. Many people, including me, had lost their jobs. And the ones who kept their jobs had to work at half of their real salaries before the crisis. And you know what hurt me the most? It was the comments of visitors from abroad. Analysts, bankers, financiers who would come to such events and they would give speeches, recommendations without thoroughly understanding our problem. And that's why I had a difficulty writing today's speech, because I don't think I do understand your problems thoroughly, even though coming from an emerging market with several crises, I do probably a better job than others, but still. There is a saying in Turkish that translates into English as, a person who fell previously from a roof understands best the person who is falling from the roof. So I know it's not wise to translate uh, sayings into other languages. And I was being translated into Ukrainian one more time, so I don't know what our Ukrainian friends hear, but I think you get the picture. So, also, you may have heard the saying that in Chinese, uh, the word for crisis is composed of two Sino characters, two Chinese characters that come together. One represents danger, and the other one represents uh, opportunity. And during our crisis, believe me, more than half of the speakers, like me here today, use that cliche. And that really drove us crazy, because everyone who came, without really understanding uh, where we were, just looking from the roof, we're saying, okay, this is a crisis, but it's also an opportunity. Besides many analysts and uh, observers analyzing the Turkish economy before and after the crisis, made shallow analyses and offered uh, recommendations that did not make sense at all. Today I've seen among the speakers my Standard Bank colleague, Timothy Ash, I don't know if he's here with me today, but he's a well-respected Turkish analyst, and I'm sure he would agree with me. I hope he would agree with me on this comment. I will mention one more Turkish saying, uh, without boring you too much with Turkish sayings, but uh, I think this you'll find interesting. For the bachelor, it is very easy to divorce a wife. So, if you are not part of the problem, the solutions are always easy. And that's why you know, I really didn't understand people who came and made very general broad recommendations such as tighten your belts, cut your deficits, decrease your inflation, which are of course universally true, but they are easier said than done and not always applicable to the situation. So after the 2001 shock, nevertheless, we restructured our financial system the existing coalition government at the time took serious measures and then the government changed. We finally had a single party government uh, after 2002-2003 for many years. The old establishment was sort of wiped out and we started making reforms because we were going uh, towards the, we, were, we adopted the European Union accession program. So we established several working groups on human rights, health, legal uh, system changes, and capital markets, and Turkish commercial called banking system, what have you. Have we done enough? Definitely not. And some of these reforms, you know, we pretended that we were doing reforms. But nevertheless, this gave the financial community, the global financial community, uh, a lot of Trust. So they started investing in Turkey with the hope that the EU accession story would be realized one day. So that was a great catalyst. 
And since 2001, our GDP grew steadily, except for, uh, I think, 2008 or 2009. One year we had this uh, negative growth, but since then, since 2001, we've been growing every year. And we received, between uh, 2001, 2003, and 2013, in those eight years, we received eight times more foreign investment than we did between 1923, which is the foundation of the Turkish Republic, until 2003. So, 80 years versus 10 years, and we received eight times more. Of course, the global flows changed and improved dramatically and everything, but Turkey, through these reforms or reform attempts, say, because not all the reforms were done, gained a lot of uh, respect. During the last two, three years, though, we've been slipping a bit, maybe more than a bit. And uh, we are sort of harming our legal system, we are harming our bureaucracy, even you know the government establishment. Uh, so I think eventually we'll uh, pay a price for this. So it's obvious that Ukraine is a country that needs, that depends on foreign capital foreign financing for growth. We both have current account problems and low local savings rates. So, and we all know that, uh, well, I hope that it will uh, be enough, but the 17 million IMF bailout program will be hardly sufficient for Ukraine to get out of this crisis. So, Ukraine needs foreign funding. That's, that's a must, both in terms of debt and equity. So, what needs to be done? What can you, investment professionals, do in your own capacity? I am not a political analyst, and we have, I have, we have very senior members from bureaucracy here, from government here, and I, won't, uh, I am a humble investment banker, so I won't go beyond my capacity and try to recommend things that I should not. But what I'll do is, uh, what can we do as finance professionals, bankers, investment bankers, uh, analysts, portfolio managers, CFA charter holders, to make an impact in our market, to attract, to start attracting the local and foreign uh, funding that this country needs. As CFA Institute, in 2013, we embarked on a multi-year initiative called Future of Finance, which is a long-term global effort to restore trust in the financial system. Also globally, you know, the uh, trust in the financial system is damaged uh, very big time. Yeah. Uh, CFA Institute makes a survey with Edelman Group of the US, and every year they survey roughly 5,000 fund managers throughout the globe uh, to measure the trust into industries. And for three years in a row, the least trust, two trusted sectors are financial services and banking. This is globally. Like all these 5,000 people, they are surveyed every year, and every year the same result comes out. So people don't trust the financial services and banking. At the top of the list, the most trusted sector comes out as technology. So this, something needs to be done. And CFA Institute started this uh, Future of Finance project. Of course, maybe it started a little late. Maybe we needed a crisis in the developed markets to start that. But nevertheless, it has started. So as leader of uh, the financial sector in our respective countries, it's our responsibility to cooperate with policymakers and regulators in our respective countries to st strengthen our financial system. So we need to educate our people, we need to educate the investment professionals, and also we need to do some advocacy work and uh, team up with the, with the uh, regulators and policy makers. Like, you know, you, all of you uh, finance uh, professionals need to be part of the Ukrainian authorities' reform agenda or the EU integration plan. And you have to do your best for Ukraine to adopt the global best practices. You have to come up with ideas and feed your 
government people, feed your policy makers. They all know that. They, they know most of them, but we have to also strive to cooperate with them. And also, demographics is a big problem in Ukraine. It's not only politics or economy, but demographics is a major problem. And uh, as famous philosopher Auguste Comte once said, demographics is destiny. You know, so there needs to be something done. And again, I am sure policymakers are aware of this. But we as investment professionals have to keep telling the policymakers that with these demographics, it is almost impossible for Ukraine to attract long-term foreign capital, especially in, in uh, like equity-like uh, investments. It's quite difficult. So, of course, it's a very long-term thing to change. It's not easy to change, but something has to be done. And we have to, as investment professionals, you have to keep reminding the government and come up with ideas if possible. So, as I said at the beginning, I've been through many crises. And uh, so you can consider me as a crisis survivor. And uh, so I, throughout all these crises, I, I learned one thing, that all crises end. They end eventually. Some last long, some last short, some do more damage than others, but they all end. And this crisis you're in will end eventually. As I am sure that someday in Turkey we'll go into a crisis. I hope it will be a little later, but we'll go into a crisis, and that one will end too. So, until it ends, it's up to us to protect and further improve our institutions. So, your capital markets, your stock exchange, your legal system, your self-regulatory institutions, your self-inflicted ethics code, professional standards, they all must be intact. And most importantly, the investor trust into the system should not vanish. That's something we all need to protect. So if we can all achieve this, I'll, be, I'll believe we'll be all in much better shape when the crisis ends. Thank you very much.